there's a lot of issues for us to cover, and I don't think that we'll be able to cover everything. Um, I could just say about myself, I teach at City College of San Francisco part-time. I've been there for over 20 years. I've taught at many of the other community colleges. And John, who will be speaking after me, is, is um, he's taught part-time at different colleges, and right now he's at Merritt's. And he'll probably introduce, say more about himself when he starts speaking. Um, so I was going to go first. And again, I'm focusing on what is the title, which is the attacks on working people and what's happening in higher education. And a lot of what I say will be based on my experience at City College, but I think it applies to colleges beyond City College. But in any case, colleges across the country have been underfunded for years. And with the pandemic, the underfunding is getting even worse. And it's resulting in numerous class cuts and thousands who work at the community colleges especially are losing their jobs, especially those who are part-time faculty or contingent faculty who make up the majority of the faculty at the community colleges. And I'll get to the city college situation in a minute. Um, many of the contingent and part-time faculty, if you aren't aware of it, actually live in poverty and they're on public assistance. And with having to go to, onto the internet, many of them even lack the equipment and internet access to be able to teach online. Um, in some colleges across the country, I keep on seeing articles about this, even people with tenure are being laid off. And usually when you get tenure, you feel secure that you don't have a job for the rest of your life. And even they are vulnerable in some places. At City College in particular, in May, we had an interim chancellor and she announced that 250 people were losing their jobs. I assume that all of them were part-timers. They made up about a third of the part-time faculty and that they would be cutting some 800 classes. And this is an addition. In addition, recently they announced that they're getting rid of all the part-time librarians. So the college is getting devastated and this is, in theory, not supposed to be happening because the states decided to fund the community colleges at the same level as last year with no cost of living increase, and yet they're decimating the place at City College. But this has been going on for, since the accreditation crisis, which I won't be talking about back in 2012. The college has been severely downsized. Um, one of the programs especially hard hit is English as a Second Language. Um, all part-time instructors with less than 14 years of, of experience at the college were laid off. And the ESL programs are very important because a lot of the college population are students who first start out in ESL classes that are non-credit. They go into the credit classes and then they eventually work to get their degrees. So if you're cutting out these classes now, you're going to be even make, making fewer opportunities available for these particular students. As probably many of you know, community colleges in California, when we weren't as wealthy, was once free back in the 1980s. Now it costs $46 a unit. City College has an exception for residents of San Francisco who can go for free. There's also, um, there's also um, um, Board of Governor waivers for low-income students so that they can attend tuition-free. But the problem with anything that's tuition-free is that that's only one small part of the cost of attending. Um, textbooks these days can cost a couple hundred dollars, and so the textbooks to attend the classes can be more expensive than, than the tuition itself. And frankly, to be successful in, in college, you need more than free tuition. You even need more than free textbooks, um, especially with the pandemic. Students need computers. They need good internet access. They need a quiet place to work. They need housing security, food security. Uh, you know, a lot of the students are homeless and don't, can't count on getting three meals a day. They need access to medical uh, care. So many, especially those who are less well off, are lacking these things and they're gonna be lacking them even more so as the economy goes into the toilet, assuming it continues to do so. And this is exacerbating class differences which also means in our country, racial differences. And what is really happening in, in our educational system, at least at the community college level with, in the urban communities, is that there's really a perpetuation reinforcement of what I'd call institutional racism. And by that I mean where the operation of our institutions perpetuates keeping most people of color, especially people who are black or Latinx, 
in inferior positions within our society and much worse off economically. And by cutting out all these classes, well, let me just say that City College, most of the students are overwhelmingly students of color, about 80% of the population. And most of them are working class or come from the lower middle class. So when you're cutting their programs and their access to an education, you're really harming these people and you're perpetuating, again, what I'm calling institutional racism. And so if the school's being underfunded, classes are being cut, the students lack this equipment that they need, then um, again, we're reinforcing this institutional racism that keeps these students in inferior positions within our society. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that most politicians and administrators of these colleges will say that they aren't responsible for reinforcing institutional racism. They probably see themselves as anti-racist. I'm willing to bet that a lot of them even have Black Lives Matter signs in their windows at, in their homes. And they would claim that they have no intention of furthering racism in our society. They want to rid us of racism. But their policies and their decisions that they're carrying out in our capitalist society is reinforcing and reinstituting institutional racism. And what's really most unfortunate about this is that many of these people are themselves people of color and they're perpetuating this. I mean, at City College, a lot of the top administrators are people of color, but they're carrying out these cuts and all the other problems. Another thing that's been happening across the country in terms of college education is what I'd call the corporate model is being more and more adopted. And that's happening at City College, which has been severely downsized. You know, the, literally it's probably where a level of thousands of classes has been cut. Additionally, like many other colleges across the country, what's happening is that we have an excessive number of overpaid administrators. While faculty numbers may not be going up, the number of administrators is going up. And boy, the ones at City College have paid about 25,000 over the state average for administrators. They're also placing an emphasis on what they call productivity. What they mean by that is that one of the great things about community colleges is that the colleges are small so that you can get to know the students. They have interpersonal relationships with their instructors as opposed to like a UC where an introductory class can have 500 students in it. Um, and, and what they want is the, for the classes to have even more students. I think someone had, was recently talking with our new chancellor at City College. He wants 50 students per class. That's gonna take away from individual interaction between the students and the teachers. And another part of this corporate education, well, let me say what it doesn't do. It doesn't try to create more well-rounded, socially engaged and culturally enriched individuals as a purpose of education. Instead, the ideal is training students so that they graduate with skills desired by businesses. In other words, they're there to serve the interest of business. Obama stated this quite clearly in his 2014 State of the Union address. He said he wants to connect in his, his words, companies to community colleges that can help design training to fill their specific needs. His vision was that companies go to the colleges, they say, this is what we kind of training we want from, for your students so that they have skills. That way we won't have to pay for this training as they would have in the past. Instead, um, the, the public is paying for this training. And then ideally for them, you create a glut of workers. You train too many, that will keep wages down and salaries down. The other thing that's happening, part of this corporate agenda is many students will also be tr tr um, transferring to four-year colleges, getting trained for that. But when they transfer, they will then just have higher level jobs and say those who are just graduates of community colleges. Um, that's meant at City College that many programs are getting eliminated or reduced. Programs that serve older adults have been eliminated. Although I taught in Peralta in the early 1980s, and that was my first job there was teaching older adults, and those programs were getting gutted back then. Um, programs in arts are being eliminated at City College. That's meant the closure of Fort Mason. Classes that allow students to explore alternative interests that may not be job-related are seen as superfluous. They're eliminated. Diversity studies programs are, have been severely reduced though that may have a bit of a comeback because the CSUs are now apparently going to be requiring a diversity study class as a graduation requirement. 
Uh, I mean, basically the focus is on classes that students need to graduate. So additionally, with the economic downturn, this is a time where more people want to be enrolled in school and taking classes to learn new job skills. And what we see instead is that hundreds of classes are being cut. Again, it may be less severe in other community colleges in California because of the funding that the state recently appropriated, but not at City College, not at, in the Peralta system. So you have more students wanting classes, fewer classes being offered. If it's anything like the Great Recession, there are some 500,000 students that could not get access to classes during the Great Recession back in 2009, 2010. So to summarize what I'm trying to say is that educational opportunities are becoming less accessible when there's a need for them to be more accessible. The main victims of this are working class students of color and poor whites. So it's reinforcing this institutional racism. There's a lot more availability for going to schools like at the Ivy League colleges, for example, even if they're gonna be online. And so what's happening is the opposite of what should be happening. Instead of there being greater educational opportunities, greater support so students can get educated, they're being reduced. Um, for me, this comes as no surprise, that's capitalism. And it's a system that has historically failed people to meet their basic needs. And now it's you know, showing that it has even greater failures that we're seeing during the pandemic. In terms of what I want to talk about, I wasn't planning to primarily talk about Peralta, partly because I expect to see more people here today from a, a broader diversity. Uh, and we do in fact have some people from Peralta uh, here. Uh, what I will say is the story of Peralta is pretty similar to the story at uh, CCSF uh, with uh, the main difference being that we aren't quite as broke. In other words, we technically have a balanced budget whereas uh, CCSF is in, severe, is in severe financial trouble. And despite claims to the contrary uh, from some quarters to justify cuts, Peralta is not. Uh, so, uh, but basically it's the same things have been going on at CCSF has been going on at Peralta. And we have discussion. Some of the people who hear from uh, Peralta might want to talk about that. And maybe uh, if we have time, I could talk about some of, this, uh, some of the details about that. But what I really want to talk about, my objective uh, for this presentation is to talk about why it is that community colleges have been under attack and are being downsized all over California and all over America, even before the coronavirus broke out. And now, of course, we're going from crisis to catastrophe. Uh, and of course, what to do about it. Now, I'm gonna start with the overall historical background for the very simple reason that I am a historian by trade. I teach history at Merritt College, sometimes as a part-timer. Uh, in the aftermath of World War II, the United States of America, who were the great winner of that war, was on top of the world, economically, militarily, culturally, socially, and in every other way. This made it possible a huge expansion of college education after World War II, uh, with a huge increase in the percentage of people uh, going to college in America over the past, which also meant a lot more than in other countries. And in the 1960s, that led to an opening up of public education and even moves towards a student control of education, starting with the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. Uh, now in the two-year colleges, which back then were called junior colleges, uh, we, saw, uh, we saw a reduction of the corporization, if, to use that expression, of what used to be called junior, colleges that used to have a purely vocational uh, purpose and, even, and, uh, and turning them into colleges more like the four-year colleges where students were at the, in the 1960s were going on strike, taking over buildings, and trying to redirect educational programs in many different radical ways, which those of us who are uh, on the older side may even remember. Uh, but then what happens is the United States had a war, Vietnam, and the United States lost that war for the first time ever. Uh, and it's essentially been downhill for America ever since, when you get right down to it, uh, not least in education. And that's why it is here in liberal California, the bluest of blue states, the prison system is better funded than education. And last time I uh, saw a listing, I think we were 38th on the states and the percentage uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, per capita percentage of what's spent on education at all levels, which is an absolute disgrace. Uh, but, uh, and as we all know by now, police brutality and outright murder of black people is every bit as common in California as in red states like Texas. 
ever since, really ever since Vietnam, or at least since the 1980s, uh, expenditures on public education, absolutely in California and nationwide to a certain degree too, have been a downward spiral. Just like health expenditures have been too, with the disastrous consequences uh, in the coronavirus crisis that we all know. I mean, the last 10 years, it's amazing how many hospitals were closed and uh, how little, uh, how few masks were available, how few ventilators were available, all due to bipartisan budget cuts, which both the Democrats and Republicans got behind. So tuition hikes began uh, when I was, a, you know, it used to be tuitions were very low and it wasn't even just the community colleges that had free tuition, you know? Uh, so tuition hikes began even at the community college level and the community colleges started to transform from being general education institutions who was going back to being vocational schools for the poor, uh, fitted to corporate needs for skilled employees, plus prep schools for middle-class students, especially white ones, whose grades weren't good enough to get them into the good colleges in the first place, the first time around. So you get the huge emphasis on STEM, cookie cutter learning outcomes, the student evaluations game, and all that other unpleasant stuff going on in the community colleges that those of us who teach there are all too familiar with, but to be discussed at another time. In the last analysis, it's always about money. There's less and less money for education these days and more and more for the police and the military and in a deindustrializing America who control over the rest of the world has been steadily diminishing since 9-11 uh, and two more wars, an unsuccessful war in Iraq and a one in Afghanistan that it looks like uh, uh, the United States is about to lose outright with uh, Trump finally giving up. Uh, and what's more, we were really just coming out of the Great Recession of 2008 uh, when the corona catastrophe hit. Given US domination of the world economy, uh, most other countries were even worse off during the Great Recession. But now the USA, currently under the brilliant leadership of that stable genius Donald Trump, uh, is dealing significantly worse with the coronavirus than any other country, any other major country at least. The American empire, which looked like it was completely ruling the world in the back in the 90s after the Soviet Union collapsed and people were talking about essentially uh, US hegemony forever or something uh, uh, after America having won the Cold War, the American empire is in big trouble and has, uh, and has clearly been so since 9-11 at least. Uh, so the powers that be in this country are steadily been getting less and less inter interested in educating the population and more and more in keeping them in line and trying to look the other way when racist police brutality gets out of hand. And now the American people are trying to make it known to the people who run this country that they just can't do that anymore. Okay. Meanwhile, the ever more ground down American lower, lower classes are taking the corona disaster on their chins, okay? With unemployment stimulus checks about to run out next week, uh, with eviction moratoriums ending nationwide, and with workers nationwide being shoved right back on the job despite grossly inadequate protections against the virus, we may be about to see social explosions in America that could make the nationwide revolt that's been going on in the last month or two against police brutality look like damn firecrackers. Uh, the world is changing and America is changing. So in the middle of all this, what's going on with our community colleges? Okay, year by year and decade by decade, they have become less and less about enabling students to think about America and maybe what's wrong with the place, what the free speech movement wanted people to be thinking about back in the 60s, and more and more about making them cogs in the corporate machine what Mario Savio denounced in his famous uh, speech keynoting the free speech movement. Put what money there is into STEM and maybe get rid of things like history and ethnic studies altogether, right? A big part of that has been shoving online education down the throats of students and faculty at the community colleges. Community college students, especially those like CCSF and Peralta, uh, the students are often non-white often poor and often from high schools in communities that are grossly inferior to the, school, to the public schools for, uh, for white people, not even speaking of the private schools. They need much more day-to-day -day support from instructors than online classes can provide. 
But the coronavirus disaster has made that a transformation very, very difficult to fight against. Okay. So far, thus far at least, the, the California state government is not trying, yet trying, unlike some other states, uh, to reopen the schools on a face-to-face -face basis, whether you're talking K-12 or the community colleges. Mostly due to the resistance that it's faced, not least due to the resistance uh, uh, from the unions uh, and school boards in LA and so forth. Uh, in current conditions, to do that would be further strengthening the surge in coronavirus cases currently overwhelming California. Okay? Instead, Governor Newsom and his servitors are simply contenting themselves with putting everything online to the tremendous disadvantage of non-white and poor people. Okay? The irony is that meanwhile, other countries right now are reopening the schools successfully and safely, okay? Why can't we do it here? For one simple reason. That requires money and lots of it, you know? Uh, and the downward spiral of education budgets in the US, I've already talked about means to do it right would probably require doubling the education budget in California, federally, and in every state to be able to do what many other countries have, uh, have done, having a uh, class school rooms, which are spacious and well ventilated uh, with everyone see, uh, sitting uh, six feet apart with every single person in there wearing a mask with the instructors if need be uh, and other adult workers if need be wearing uh, you know, N95 masks, you know, all the, all the expensive things that you need to do uh, to get it uh, done properly under these conditions are unthinkable uh, in a situation where uh, the trajectory isn't to uh, increase the education bu budget, but to, uh, it actually is more cuts, not increases, as federal and state budgets go ever deeper into the hole, right? Uh, for the moment, the state of California is avoiding immediate cuts through a smoke and mirrors game with deferments, but who knows how long that's going to last. The steady bipartisan cuts in the health budgets over the last few decades, with hospitals closing left and right, set America up for the coronavirus disaster. Now the equally bipartisan steady cuts in educational expenditures are destroying education in California in particular and America in general. Now I'm speaking here as a labor representative for my position as a member of the executive committee of Peralta Federation Teachers uh, uh, 1603, the Alameda County College Instructors Local. So I wanna talk about what the unions need uh, to, uh, to resist and fight back. About three minutes, John. Okay. Uh, in general, the labor officials in all unions, especially our faculty unions, resort to feudal reliance on liming the Democratic Party, on which huge amounts of dues money, ha which could have been used to organize the unorganized, has been wasted. Instead of the militant methods that built the unions in the 1930s, uh, the faculty, the students, their parents, and blue and white collar workers of the colleges as well have every reason to fight back against what is ascending on the community colleges at a moment when so many, so many people, like Rick said, out of work, the demand for affordable college courses is higher than ever. If that hasn't exploded just yet, it's because of the dislike of most community college students for online classes. Now, we had a nationwide wave of teacher strikes a few years ago from West Virginia to Oakland uh, and many other states and cities in between. Some succeeded better than others, but they all at least tried to follow the West Virginia model where the West Virginia teachers put forth demands that everyone else supported, including the other unions, the parents, the students, and in West Virginia, even the, some of the school principals. And we're not the least bit bothered by the fact their strike was highly illegal and resisted by their own unions officers who wanted to lobby the Democrats in the state legislature instead. That's the model we need to follow. The prime necessity for our unions and for all unions to break for the Democratic Party and return to the militant labor strategy of our grandparents and great grandparents of the 30s. The tie between the Democrats and the unions is the curse of the American labor movement, definitely including our faculty unions. Now, can we follow a strategy like that in lockdown conditions in the middle of a pandemic? What we need to realize is that does not necessarily make workers and unions weaker, but stronger. Since right now, if your labor isn't needed by society and you can't work at home, you aren't working. In a situation where we may well soon see even larger explosions of popular anger, we may not need to follow the old rules any more than they did in West Virginia. The nationwide revolt against police brutality has gone on despite the pandemic, and as things get desperate, more popular revolts are bound to break out. The labor movement takes the leadership, not limp along behind. We need to prepare for strike action backed up by massive popular mobilization. And anyone who doesn't think that is possible, last month you could have gone out on the streets and smelled the tear gas. And that's still going on up in, up in Portland, I hear. The absolute last thing I wanna say is about programs. 
the labor movement needs programs going beyond immediate union needs that addresses the needs of everyone, and indeed the needs of all Americans in a country going down the tubes, where the great majority of workers are non-union. Instead of futile reliance on the Democrats, we need a workers' party in alliance with the Black Lives Matter movement, and in general, with oppressed minorities, Blacks, Latinos, in seeking fundamental social transformation. What the coronavirus catastrophe should reveal to everyone is as long as we're still under a social system in which nothing gets produced unless someone gets a, makes a buck off of it, anything in the public sector, like education or health, is a secondary sideshow to be dispensed with, with results for education that may turn out to be as disastrous as the results for human health. Um, I can just add one thing, since John was talking about, you know, what's going on with this, the unions. Um, the local at my college is, is not doing a whole lot. Um, they were being told that we'd have to take a pay cut or at least a pay freeze, and there was a lot of agony about that. And then all of a sudden, a couple of days ago, they announced that we're going to stick, they're going to adhere to the contract and people will get their normally their normal pay increase. And I can only think that that's because they've laid off so many part-timers and they've cut so many classes, and they're also going to tap into a trust fund it's set aside mainly for retiree medical benefits for full-timers, that that's how they're going to be funding things, which is problematic in itself. But maybe while we wait, John, you could talk about the possible takeover at Peralta because it's so similar to what's happened to City College when it was put in, in show, on show cause by the accreditors in 2012 and then threatened with the closure. Oh. Uh, we've, we've essentially been in a real roller coaster at Peralta. You know, first, last year, uh, we had a whole mobilization around uh, the possibility of a strike, the main issue of which was going to be, uh, actually, really, the only issue was going to be equal pay, uh, hourly pay for part-timers. Then um, we had a compromise settlement in February, and before anyone could take a breath and start thinking about the huge budget, uh, budget cuts that were impending on us, uh, then you have the coronavirus, and then, of course, uh, then we were all being forced online. And now the latest is, and then we had a chancellor who utterly refused to talk to the union about anything. And it finally got to the point where even the board of trustees got a bit unhappy. And about a week or so ago, uh, when the board of trustees for the first time refused to immediately rubber stamp one of her decisions, she resigned in a huff, denouncing the board of trustees for allegedly uh, being in cahoots with the union, which is not really true, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, they just simply wanted to do the job they were elected for. Uh, and uh, apparently all the indications were is that she's been wanting the state to, uh, there have been moves for a long time for the state to take over Peralta, and she's on board with that. And uh, however, that's not happening immediately. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, public officials are, uh, are not uh, in Oakland and, and, and Berkeley are definitely not thrilled with the idea, and the memory of what happened with SFCC is not exactly a pleasant one. So yes, so the Board of Governors for the state of California uh, would love to take over Peralta and really downsize the place even further and turn it m more and more uh, into uh, simply a, a prep school for uh, four-year colleges uh, and to hell with the, uh, uh, with the poor and minority students. But uh, that can't happen immediately. And now we're in a situation where we know that the possibility is impending and our union is going to be attempting to mobilize against that. Exactly how is a matter for internal discussion, which has only just started. I am here. Can you oh, hear great. me? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're now you're fine. Um, let me just introduce you real quickly. Carol works in CUNY. She's a his, history um, faculty member who's part time, and she's been at meetings today. And why don't you just go ahead? John and I have already spoken about our issues and we're going to then have a discussion afterwards. Let's Hi, I'm probably, I'm sorry I didn't hear the discussion that uh, Rick and John were just involved with because my union was just, just Steve will be happy about this, passed the resolution on the murals saying that the murals should stay and 101 to one um, and that they shouldn't be whitewashed by the superintendent. Um, so that's the second union. But see, that's the thing that my union does. I'm sure it's very similar to your union. I'd like to read two resolutions, just indicating the difference between the union leadership 
And the group that I'm involved with, which is inside the union, it's called Rank and File Action. And what we're trying to do, they just laid off um, 2,800 people, mostly adjuncts, part-time workers. So that means that everybody is going to be forced to have 30 students in a class. Um, the union has typically sent out petitions for us to sign, send letters, pass the CARES Act. I'm sure this all sounds incredibly familiar. Um, and at our urgency, people in Rafa, um, they've organized actually car caravans that have gone around the city and we've had Zoom meetings so that everybody can see the car caravans that are going around the city. But Rafa, Rank and File Action, has organized a strike authorization petition that we're sending out to everybody and we, we think that we should go out on strike. We have a Taylor law that prevents us from going out on strike, but it also basically prevents us from doing anything to really fight against the city's attack. Um, and the union, the first day of classes is August 26th. The union is proposing that we have some action on the 26th, but has not told anybody, any of them, members what they propose to do, which is just amazingly bizarre. And then they want us to pledge that we will support whatever it is that they're planning to do, which, you know, I mean, if you heard, I'm sure Rick and John, it's probably all very similar. The, the budget has been cut by, you know, millions of dollars. I, I might add that at the same point at which they were cutting 2,800 low, low paid workers, they hired seven or eight administrators for $2 million. This was in the same exact time frame. So do they care about education? No, not particularly. They want to formalize everything. They want to put everybody in line. They want to systematize everybody and have, you know, pretty much no individuality, no creativity, no nothing. And I'm worried that we're going to be online even after the point at which we won't have to be online anymore. So there was a resolution besides the one that was just passed um, about the murals that one of the people in Rafa had put out, I mean, in response to the neo-Nazis that are rampaging all over the place and murdering people, um, in, in response to that, let me just read it to you. This is in response to the, the original motion, which is, whereas white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and fascists have no place in the PSC, that's the Professional Staff Congress, or the labor movement more generally, Whereas the PSC is an organization that fights for all members regardless of race and denounces racial chauvinism. Be it resolved at the, the Graduate Center, those are the people that put it forward, that's one of the units at the City University, chapter calls on the PSC through the Delegate Assembly to amend the PSC Constitution to ban any member of white supremacist, neo-Nazis and or fascist organizations from holding office in the PSC. The article section shall be added. No person shall be permitted to hold chapter or union-wide office who is a member of the white supremacist, neo-Nazi and or fascist organization, or who consistently pursues policies or activities directed towards a white supremacist, neo-Nazi or fascist ideology. So we're asking that never will there be allowed to be any leadership being able to, to response is the PSC, I, mean, I took a picture of it, um, seeks to advance the dignity and power of all of our members in favor and to favor the best values of the academic 
sorry, I, it's very small, academic community within the, within the union's membership and governing bodies. PSC members unite for the common interests of all university faculty and staff by promoting practic, practic, practices, sorry, that dignify the work and enrich our community of colleagues. The union condemns bigotry and oppression on all forms, including oppression based on sex, physical ability, age, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. The PSC works actively to dismantle racism and white supremacy, whether it occurs in the union, in CUNY, in the labor movement, in the city, or in the society as a whole. The PSC is committed to upholding the integrity of education and in advancing education's vital role of both understanding and transforming the worlds in which our members and students live. The PSC advocates for economic, racial, and so social justice for our members and for all workers. Um, the PSC expects that all elected officers, delegates, and chapter chairs will honor the purposes of the union and serve the best interests of all members of the faculty and staff, as well as the students who have entrusted their ed education to us. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, people understand the difference between the resolutions but the first resolution, which was put out by a member of RAFA, Rank and File Action, is saying that the union needs to kick people out who are racist, period, or are homophobic, or whatever part of neo-Nazi organizations. The union, on the other hand, has this aversion to creating anything that has any teeth. So if you heard what I said, Basically, what they were saying is, oh, yes, we oppose racism. We oppose a, a university that's racist and sexist and blah, 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 blah. But there's absolutely no teeth that is part of this. And this was considered a substitute amendment to the first one. And uh, rightly so, there were especially Black people in my union who objected and said, this is not a substitute. There are no teeth here. We want to have something that not only calls on Blacks and, and Latins in the, in the CUNY community to help write this resolution, but we want something that's meaningful, that's going to have some teeth to it. And there was just one person who spoke and said, well, you know, maybe Republicans could be okay and they could be in the union and whatever. So it didn't get resolved because it's a, going to be a very long process. But ultimately, this is my union. This is a union that is afraid to take any active stance on anything unless they're absolutely forced to do so. And so we who have organized, there's probably 50 of us in Rafa, and we have probably another 50 in our periphery who have been organizing on the ground for the last couple of years. First, we organized to fight for $7,000 a class because people are living in absolute poverty. They, up until the last contract, made $3,500 a class and now are making 4,000. And ultimately by the end of the contract, 2023, people will be making you know, 5,500. Um, on the other hand, now we have 2,800 people who are now unemployed and because their medical insurance is tied to their jobs, they don't have any medical insurance either. So the situation is grim, we are, demanding that our governor Cuomo tax the billionaires in New York. There's, a, there's like over 600 billionaires that live in New York City. And he basically he's, has argued that you can't tax your way out of this crisis. And yet he, you can lay, lay people off out of the crisis. Um, and that's pretty much what's happening. And so the union is 
attempting to save face by organizing um, ca car caravans um, that drive around the city and honk their horns and put signs on their cars saying, you know, tax the billionaires, fun CUNY. I'm sure that you've heard all of this before. It's, it's really nothing new because the union leadership, all of them across the board, operate out of the same playbook. They don't want to do anything militant. They don't want to challenge the bosses in any meaningful way. They don't want to strike, which is what we have to do if we're going to be successful. Um, and, you know, in the past, in 2012, uh, Barbara Bowen, who is our president, ended up taking a strike authorization vote because we couldn't get a contract. And it was just a way of saying, you know, look Cuomo, look what we got. We got the strike authorization vote. You better listen to us because 92% of the union supported the strike authorization vote. And yet now that it's really absolutely mandatory that we go out on strike. In fact, Rafa, rank and file action is trying to organize not just inside the, the PSC, the Professional Staff Congress, which we are, but we're trying to unite the labor force of New York City, especially people in the UFT um, who are now, and this is the case all throughout the country, are now being forced to go back to, to death sentences if they go back to school. All those kids, all those teachers, they're all gonna get COVID and they're gonna die. So you know, basically what the teachers are objecting to going back. So we need to organize collectively to end this absurdity. Am I close? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I muted myself. Take about another minute or so. Okay, okay. so, so just, just to end, um, we are having a tremendous impact on the union. Um, and, you know, we're, we're actually recruiting people because people are now terrified who have lost their jobs and are probably pretty close to losing their jobs, who are now willing to sign the strike authorization petition, which we will then demand that the union ultimately respect. And hopefully the first day of class, which will be the 26th, you know, the union will flex its muscles. Hey, th thanks, Carol. So what we'd like to do is open it up to people's comments and questions. Maybe we should start first with any particular questions, but and to keep it to no more than three minutes, I guess is what John said. Carol, there's all these people who've lost their jobs in CUNY, mm -hmm. and what is happening with all the people losing their jobs, and what is the union saying about that? And what will that mean for students wanting to take classes? Well, they will be able to collect unemployment insurance for the next six months, and the union has said this is terrible, disgusting, horrible, you know, all of the things you could possibly imagine. Um, and they're going to apply, you know, force against CUNY. So they have the car caravan and they're going to do something mysterious on August 26th that nobody knows what in fact they are going to plan to do. Um, I actually got off of the Zoom meeting that I was just on where they were talking about you know, what their plans are. So I'll, I'll find out when I get off of this call what ultimately ended up happening. But, you know, unless they call a strike, it doesn't really matter all else, whatever they do, because we've signed every petition that we could possibly sign and we've written every letter and demonstrated in, in front of Albany and begged the politicians. I mean, you know, there's nothing new under the sun with these people. The only thing that they could do is strike. And so unless they're willing to do that, then this is going to be what's going to continue. People are going to be online. They're going to have more students in their classes. Being online is driving people crazy, basically, um, because we have to take these courses that go go on and on and on and and you know, they're, they're, you have to be really know a lot about technology in order to be able to do these things, which 
and I know people in my department and history department have already quit because they just can't handle it. One of the things is the corporatization of community colleges has been going on for a long, a long time. It's nothing new. Uh, they, they want to turn the community colleges into junior colleges. So the, the issue has been, uh, why is there no political education campaign and, uh, against the, uh, these attacks? And also, why hasn't the, uh, Governor Newsom, the Democrats, been challenged? That's the question. Because in San Francisco, it was the Democrats who passed legislation that cut back funding to community colleges to force them to say students had to graduate in, in two years. A lot of students cannot attend a community college full time. They're working. The question is, is why, why has that not happened? And the reason is, oh, the reason is, is that um, the, they don't want to conflict with the Democrats. In San Francisco, there are Democrats who passed the legislation, Chu and Wiener and others, they passed the legislation to corporatize city colleges, to cut funding for city colleges. There are 175 billionaires in California. They're not demanding a capital tax on these billionaires to pay for uh, funding, a full funding of education. And um, the latest uh, uh, canard that really the unions are involved in in San Francisco, the community college, AFT 2121, is to have an extra fund, uh, not, not additional funds making the billionaires pay, but an extra fund pitting the city college uh, uh, faculty and staff against the other city agencies who are in a budget crisis. So this is their plan, not go after the billionaires, but pit one group against another group. So I think that the, the house is coming down though, because what we're facing in California is a, is a massive budget deficit in cities and state funding. And the Republicans are not gonna come up with funding for public services and public education. So this means there, there is really the need for statewide and national action of the education and public service unions in a united action. There's no call for that by the unions. The, the AFT, the NEA, uh, none of these unions, he's on, none of these unions are actually saying there has to be united action of all public workers against the Democrats and Republicans because the Democrats in California run California and they don't want to go after the billionaires. So I think that's, it's a political crisis oh, yeah, yeah. That the unions are in. And I think that that's really what the crux of the issue. Can I just make one statement? I just got a, an email from one of the people who is in Rafa on the DA. I thought maybe I'd put the two together, but this is the, remember I told you the famous August 26th, what we're going to be doing. My friend said, um, Bowen announced at the DA meeting tonight, at the big August 26 action, we've been phone banking, everybody's been phone banking, for will be a 24-hour online action. So that's what we're going to do. Some 24-hour online action, as opposed to stopping working. Since George is here, um, hi George, welcome. This the title is Community Colleges Under Attack, Working People and the Right to Higher Public Education, Racism and Capitalism. So I think yes, the general sir. theme is that there are fewer educational opportunities happening when there should be more, and there's all these cuts that people are, in, are having to endure, and it's freezing out the students who are, say, the colleges that the three of us teach at are predominantly students of color. So it's yeah. just kind of structural racism. Yeah, oh, I, I concur wholeheartedly with that, but yes. Um, I guess my contribution is that, uh, uh, that one, uh, obviously uh, this crisis that we're in now under the umbrella of COVID-19 is uh, the most serious crisis in the history of the country and perhaps one of the more serious economic political crises in the history of the world, at least the industrial uh, the last uh, the last three or four hundred years, uh, but what I also want to add is that what this what crises allow is for the ruling class to uh, oftentimes accelerate uh, a project that had been already underway for uh, quite a few years, and as Rick and and Stephen you guys know, is that. The, the privatization of higher education and specifically in education as a whole has been underway for the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, at the core of this has been the drive for the accumulation of profit 
uh, up till a year ago that over a trillion dollars a year was spent in higher in public education and that with a crisis of capital accumulation on the part of uh, the, the corporations because they don't make profits on on production anymore they make profits on speculation um, that they 40 years ago they realized that if you could privatize public education that there would be an enormous amount of, of profits uh, to to garner in that sense secondly what we've seen is going all the way back to the reagan administration you've seen each administration whether a republican or democrat putting together a set of policies educational policies that have targeted both uh, the elementary level as well as higher education community colleges have been particularly targeted uh, because the goal has been to uh, privatize in general which also means to have the administration of community colleges uh, corporatized and then secondly to try to undermine prevent liberal arts as and humanities as a co a co excuse me a, a core element of of education and to push education towards uh, community colleges towards uh, vocational training and uh, and the like and what 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 this crisis has done has allowed that project to accelerate uh, to the to degree that uh, I, there's no normal anymore. I think you guys have probably talked about the conditions that exist today related to this. I guess that's about all I, I have to say at this point. Okay. Well, we also want to hear. I mean, there are there's about four or five people who are here. So, again, we talked with some of you at the beginning. Any any of you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make? And you can just raise your hand or I can unmute you. I mean, I think we were going to go till maybe 630. Um, although the four of us could talk among each other. Um, talk to me. That's me. <laughs> okay. I'm a, like a product of City College. When I came to this country, um, I was so busy trying to survive. Then I found out that um, Oh, I can go to um, um, some adult school, uh, you know, where they can teach me English. So, um, so I I went to adult school, which you know, ESL class that uh, teach me English. Then I was taking some, you know, while working, taking some classes. Then some of the Chinese students, classmates whose English is worse than me, they're talking about, we go to city college. They said, oh my God, you can go to city college and uh, you know, free? Yeah, okay, then I'll apply for that too. So I get the paper from the Japan and then I apply for it. And I went to, uh, you know, San Francisco City College. Start taking classes. I was so happy taking classes and you know working as a waitress in the meantime, and you know I uh, had a fun time. Uh, then um, one of the English, English teacher told me, "Oh, you should go to university. You know, why don't you go to the Berkeley?" They said, "No, I'm not gonna go cross the bridge and then go over there. You know, <laughs> I'd rather you know just uh, stay here." But then um, I feared I can go to um, I can go to state then uh, SF state, so I decided to get you know unit together, and um, I went to uh, SF state. Then uh, you know I had a good time there too. Of course, we were you know most of the time working and then uh, you know taking classes in the meantime. Then um, after I finished the school, it took a few years, you know. Um, then uh, one of the teacher called me and said, well, we started to have uh, MFL, uh, I, I'm sorry, MFA, Master of Fine Arts classes. So why don't you apply? So I apply it, you know, I said, okay, I'll do that. You know, <laughs> that's the way it started, you know, unless I was able to go to City College, we, 
the time. I, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I couldn't get the education and I'm just busy working to survive. So, you know, I heard um, so many ESL classes that cut, so many art classes that cut at City College. And um, that will really limit the chance for the special immigrant who, who just survive, try to survive here, but meantime able to get education, to get a little bit, you know, better knowledge, better experience. And those chances are um, sort of a very, you know, pressed down. So they are stay in the just surviving level. And um, somehow the city college, what it's going through now, has to be changed. And I don't know exactly how, what we can do. I'm not involved in doing as Steve is doing, but you know. Yeah, well, I can just respond that some of the, I mean, they're adopting policies that you would expect from Trump. The, the, any of the ESL classes is hostile towards immig the immigrant community, the people who need English. And I know others have had the same experience as you. They come here and there's this great opportunity for very little money. You can attend the community college, but they are less and less interested in, in those folks doing that. I think it's partly because whenever I've seen statistics about or by the U.S. Labor Department about future job growth, it's a lot of it is in services that don't require anything more than a high school diploma. So I think part of the motivation is that they don't see a need to provide education facilities for a lot of the students who've been enjoying them. The economy is contracting and there will be some who are very ambitious who'll get through and move up, but there aren't the jobs. So why educate people if they get educated and they leave college with, with student debt, without any good job prospects except working in a Starbucks let them just go to the Starbucks when they get out of high school or do home health care or something like that right away. That's, that's my take on it. But it is one of the unusual things like my significant other, she's from France and she was just amazed that, you know, you either start college at 18 and you finish or you're through. And she came here later and she was able to, she also went to City College, San Francisco. And they're closing off those opportunities because that, that's just the approach of the administration like I said, I don't think this is happening at the higher ed, at the UCs or the Stanford's, but it's certainly happening at a place like City College. And I just want to throw in one other thing. There is the, the money that was made available from the um, legislation that was passed. And it was really interesting that this, this is what was happening that with the, you know, that first bill passed by Congress, City College is getting $7 million. <laughs> for 60,000 students, it comes to about $120 a student. I mean, it just shows you the class nature of our society. UC Berkeley was getting over 30 million, that would come to $703 per student. Stanford was getting a little bit more than City College with about a fourth the student, 7.3 million, which would come to 445 per student. But you know, Stanford has something else in their favor. They have an endowment worth close to $30 billion. So they have an endowment that comes to 1.69 million per student. And you multiply that by five, it's more money than City College is getting for 60,000 students. So it just is one more thing that's reinforcing our class structure and who are the priorities. I'm talking too much, so I don't know if John. Can I, can I respond to something that um, George said sure. about privatization? I just got a... Um, that the delegate assembly is still going on in, in New York. And I just got a, a text from one of my comrades in Rafa. And she said, um, Queens College, is, we have 25 different campuses at the Sydney University. Queens College president said the CARES Act, which is what the union is counting on in order to hire people, the CARES Act funding couldn't be used for salaries because they have to pay the bonds for the Summit Dorn, which is operated by a, um, a for-profit company. So the money that's supposed to be coming from the government to support education, rather than going to support 2,800 people have now been laid off. 
they have, in fact, we had a, a demonstration in front of the, my job at, which is a community college. And there was this poor teacher who had been laid off and right at the same time as he'd been laid off, he fell and broke his elbow. And so he has no health insurance, but he had to go to the doctor. I can't even imagine what his hospital bills are going to be. But the money that, that my president is counting on to come and pay to save us that we're all fighting for, this is the big thing, that the CARES Act is supposed to come and pay the salaries of the workers, is now going to private institutions to build dorms for public schools, rather than doing a nationalization and having the government provide the money to build the, the supply of the schools. In the last couple of months, the billionaires have made something like $600 billion within one month. And at the same time, they're laying off people. The unemployment rate is something like uh, the the amount of people is like something like 40 million. We're in a serious crisis. And if the working class doesn't organize collectively to get the hell out of it and stop supporting the Democratic Party, then we're going to be hitting 1929 levels all over again. And so we have to learn the lesson of history, which is that the working class really has to organize a general strike to demand that that money, which actually belongs to us, comes to us and not to private aid industry. But capitalism is about private profit, profit so it has to end. Uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, one thing is, for years and years and years, it's always been said, you know, that, uh, well, we couldn't get enough money for education because, you know, we have to balance the budget, there's not enough money. Uh, it's become quite obvious in this crisis that whenever the people who run this country want to spend money on something, they do. Uh, they've been uh, spending money like water uh, over, over the uh, last few months, sometimes for social needs and sometimes to line the, profit, uh, uh, the pockets of private capitalists and sometimes a little of both. Uh, so in general, whenever they say there's not enough money, don't believe it, especially don't believe in the state of California. If California was an independent country, I believe it would be uh, the ninth, have the ninth largest economy in the world. So never believe it when they say there's not enough money. Uh, if you press hard enough, the money will be discovered. I remember uh, during the Oakland teacher strike, uh, the uh, state board uh, was saying, you know, we can't give the money uh, for the raises for the teachers, we just, we just can't afford it. But the strike uh, got out of hand, it became too powerful, and suddenly they discovered they had the money. So I wouldn't even worry about, uh, I wouldn't even worry, frankly, about, uh, yeah, sure, I'm all in favor of uh, taxing the rich, but whether the rich are taxed or whether the rich are not taxed, uh, if we fight hard enough, they'll come up the money for what's needed. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that Carol raised the idea of a general strike. We have to look very concretely at our current situation. Uh, right now, uh, we're, in the, we're in a situation where, uh, essentially, uh, in this huge crisis, some workers are essential and some workers are not. If you're not an essential worker, and if you can't work at home, like many of us instructors now find ourselves doing, whether we want to or not, you're not working. So uh, basically, uh, I think there's a definite possibility of a general strike, but it's not going to come from uh, it's not going to come from college instructors. It's going to come from the essential workers being shoved back into the workplace, irregardless of the fact that uh, there's absolutely no uh, protection, uh, decent protection for them against the coronavirus. There's some extreme uh, uh, with. Uh, there are horror stories all over about different industries where you have, whereas if, uh, whereas, you know, if you're listed as an essential worker, uh, you, can get, you can get fired for not going to work, regardless of uh, what the uh, protections are. So basically, to talk about a, uh, absolutely looking for a general strike, but it has to start uh, with the essential workers, the ones who have the, their fingers on the uh, levers of the workings of our economic system, uh, transportation, food. Uh, and so on and so forth. And education is, is pretty, uh, from the standpoint of the American people, education is pretty vital, uh, vital. but you have to remember, from the same people, uh, point of the people who run this country, Harvard is, uh, is, uh, is vital, Yale is vital, MIT is vital, our community college is vital. I'm not sure they think so. So we need to understand that. So I'd like to ask uh, the people who came to, uh, to the panel, is anyone interested in or asking a question? So I think some of you had, things that you wanted to ask about. 
So anybody want to put up their hand? If not, then we can go on to someone else. Anyone else have anything to say? I, I do well, want to okay. say, oh, uh, I, I'll just- I didn't me. know. I didn't know New York had the 700 billionaires. I thought the California has 170 billionaires. I thought, oh my God, we can do something with those monies. But if New York has 700 billionaires. 600 something. Yeah. <laughs> if we went to city in the country. Yeah, anyway, we can get the money out of them. <laughs> I can think of a few ways. <laughs> You know, I, I wanted to mention, um, Michael Adams, you're here. Go ahead and speak. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I, have, I have two questions. One is uh, on the issue of striking that has just been discussed. I have belonged to six different unions and <clears throat> comfortable with striking when the product that is going to be uh, slowed down in production is something like you know cars or plumbing parts or uh, buildings, <clears throat> but when the when the impact of that is on the very students we're talking about, if we strike, the students uh, suffer. So, is that a debate that is that has been? carried out in, you know, in looking at what's the impact of the strike in a unique uh, function like teaching school. Can I uh, speak to that? Oh. Uh, yeah, and let me just throw the other one on the table real fast. Uh, I think early on, uh, it, I think Steve, the Obama years came up, um, but it also included from Obama, from Obama. 60, 60, um, what was it? Sixty billion dollars community college initiative called America College Promise. Does anybody know what happened? Well, we know we know who's president now, but that was not only a suggestion that two-year colleges turn out people for industry. Uh, it, it it did not it it did not explicitly attack studying history or the arts or music. So uh, I, I'm just curious about what, if anybody knows what happened to that initiative. That was huge money for free college for two years for students. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, now on your first question, this is a very vital question, uh, Michael, I'm glad you asked that. And actually the answer could be, uh, to that question could be seen in the wave of strikes we had starting in West Virginia. Success. Basically, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're not turning out cars. Uh, the powers that be are not making a profit necessarily. Well, they're trying to. They're trying to corporatize the schools. But but what? But the reason that a, a strike of structures can be powerful is because we are striking for the students. If the students don't support it, if their parents don't support it, if the general community doesn't support it, forget about it. And that was understood very well. In, uh, in the whole wave of strikes, like in West Virginia, where you had uh, uh, you had support not only from the students but from their parents and even some principals, we have to, we can't just uh, go on and strike for a ten percent wage increase. We have to raise that education is being destroyed uh, right. in America. And when we strike against that, then the students will be striking side by side with us. And if they're not striking side by side with us, I mean, I remember uh, the last strike that. Cal, when I was working at Cal State East Bay about eight or nine years ago, we had a strike at Cal State Hayward. I was teaching at uh, Cal State Compton. And we shut the campus down on a one-day strike because the students all supported it uh, because they were angry about uh, tuition increases at the time. So that's basically the model. That is how you can have a successful strike. Not by, not by economic leverage, but by bringing out masses and masses of people on your side because you're raising demands that they want to see raised. And in education, there's a million of them. Someone else should answer the other question. Well, I could, I'd like to respond because it's, I don't know if Peralta's like this, but right now, the col our college is held harmless budget-wise. So they're going to get the same amount of money whether they offer one class or 5,000 classes. Mm -hmm. and I, I think we're in a real pickle there because if the faculty went on strike because of all the class cuts and everything, that plays right into the hands of what the administration would like. It means they don't have to pay people for however long they're out on strike. And with mm -hmm. the pandemic, 
I think it's really hard, would be almost impossible to connect up with students. And, you know, so they just say, okay, I don't have to go online for, for the time during the strike. I mean, we're in a kind of different world, but I do want to emphasize, because there are people who say, oh, we should be going out on strike. And yet, I just don't see how that gets you anything, at least at City College. I don't know if the other community colleges are in this situation. It would have to be a more like general strike, and we would just be one part of a general strike. Mm -hmm. but again, that's really jumping the gun. I, I, don't, I don't see, at least among the faculty of City College, that happening anytime soon. As, as I said recently, all these part-timers lost their jobs. Nothing's happening with that. And the administration um, told the union the other day, no one's going to take a pay cut and get the regular pay increase. So yeah, the full-timers are going to probably be pretty happy campers about that. And they are not going to want to to do anything, which, you know, we, we got to do something. But I just don't know what. I just want to yeah. say one other thing. There's a initiative in San Francisco to get something like, $20 million a year from the city budget to going to the college, which is playing off against other needed services. And I asked John Rizzo, why do you oppose this? He's a trustee at the college because he voted, he abstained from voting in favor of it. And he said, because of the way it's written. One of the provisions is that when there's a recession, the city can stop providing the money. So the one time that you need the money in this provision that the unions can put all their a lot of effort into the money won't be available which makes it ridiculous michael i can't answer your other question i don't know that anything that obama put forward like that ever got anywhere he may have yeah. offered it up but i'm sure it didn't get passed by congress and with right. Mark duncan in charge of the department of education it was <laughs> not really good and obama wanted to provide funding for colleges at one time based on their graduation rates and then how much money people made after graduating. And then more money would be available to those who had higher graduation rates and more money would be available if the graduates made more money. So I don't know how that would have been, how, how his proposal would have been construed, but I assume it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, I think that was an interpretation. I've, I've not found that in his actual proposals that it depended on the income of graduates, but it's worth looking at it again. Yeah, I can, I can give you, well, this article I wrote for Monthly Review, I cite it. The thing is, uh, in a certain sense, uh, yeah, you're, I mean, hey, at Peralta, there's definitely no sentiment for strike uh, going on right now at Peralta. I, I know that for a fact. Uh, but, uh, and that's because we've been, everyone is so whipsawed and it, people don't know what's going on. And like you said, there are all these layoffs. But I think basically, I don't think it's, uh, so uh, I think if there's enough indignation in the community, about what's going on to education, then strike action is definitely possible. In a certain sense, the onlineization, if you think about it, uh, if you have enough support, it makes it easier to go on strike because you don't have to just throw up a picket line. Uh, but in fact, you can, because the other thing is, in fact, a serious strike would require marches, might require building takeovers, all the things that the Black Lives Matter movement have been doing, uh, lockdown or no lockdown. So, but that requires serious anger but with the things that are going on in this country, that is possible. But it's not happening next week. And I'm done. <laughs> George, did you want to say something? You look like no, you that's to... that's fine. I'm cool. Carol? Oh, you're muted. Let me un you're muted, Carol. I can't try to unmute yourself. You're still muted. Can you unmute yourself? I can't believe Carol's unmuted. Uh, I you're, Carol, you're talking and no one's hearing what you're saying. Uh, I'm trying to unmute and I'm not able to do it. Can, but usually you can do it yourself if you hover can you over. Can me oh, now? You yes. Now you're now. So start okay. the beginning. So, so basically what I wanted to say was besides the fact that we as a rank and file action inside the dissident group inside the union, there's a group called Free CUNY because at one point, the city university was free up until 1976, and that was an absolute racist move on the part of the state to impose tuition on students of color who started to come to school en masse in 1969 with open admissions. And the demands that Rafa is making is that we go back to open admissions and that there be free tuition. But 
the students are in support of that. So that I, I wanted to answer Michael that we're not just striking, although certainly we need more money and we want those jobs back, but we're striking to have a, a CUNY, a city university that really wants to educate people, that wants to, to um, you know, develop an intellectual, artistic, political university where in in the CUNY, in the in the junior colleges, people go for automotive engineering. And one of my students in my history class who clearly liked history, I said to him, so are you gonna take another history class? And he said, my financial aid won't pay for it. So the idea is to to make the community colleges in particular, and I think that um, Rick was saying this before, into you know, jobs so that people can get a job ultimately at the end of it and not to have any sort of intellectual endeavors, not to want anything more than to become a radiologist or an automotive engineer or all the other things that they're offering because, you know, you don't want to raise people's expectations. But can, in combined with the students, we are fighting for a different kind of university altogether one that will support the demands of, of a real intellectual movement among the students, meaning that we have enough resources, that we have enough faculty, that we have libraries, all the things that people need in order to be able to really call this an education. Because as of now, it's almost impossible to really attribute it to that. Yeah, I'd like to uh, add to yeah, I'd like to add to what Carol says. Uh, yeah, my major two points. One is that if you examine the history of public education going all the way back to the late 19th century, it was always a reflection of the needs of, of capitalism at any point in time. And, right. that, and, and that the elite universities obviously promoted in the before the 60s, uh, humanities, liberal arts and the like. And what we see with the baby boomers uh, in the 50s or 60s and 70s, both the, ex the expansion of the curriculum on the state college level and the community college level to include the liberal arts and the humanities, et cetera. But we also demanded these things too, uh, based on you know, the black studies movement and the like. But what's happening is neoliberalism the neoliberal version of capitalism over the last 40 years, as I said earlier, is driving the privatization and the corporatization of education. All of these things that blossomed or potentially were there for you know, individuals to experience social mobility, to be inspired by teachers, to see alternative ways of looking at the world, to, be, to understand what critical thinking is. All of that has been systematically squashed or is being squashed. And as I said earlier, that COVID-19 uh, has allowed a, a justification for the intensification of that process. But what we need, again, to set a sandwich with what Carol said, we don't need a, a capitalist education. We need a, a human, humanistic education. <laughs> Uh, to foster, uh, you know, better human beings uh, to be Democrats with a small D, even.